you know, it is nice occasionally to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. To remind us all that no, we're not actually crazy. There are people on the inside of the entertainment industry that simply just wants to ruin it. And just such an example arrived the other day on a podcast called The Town with Marvel producer Nate Moore, who had this to say about the hiring process of directors for Marvel movies. You talk about the process. For me, one thing I think is interesting, and specifically for writers, I would say, a lot of times we're pitched writers who love Marvel. And to me, that's always a red flag. Straight from the equine hole and directly into your ear canals. Nate Moore considers anyone who is actually interested in and likes the thing that they're supposed to be making a movie about to be a red flag. This is hardly a secret to any one of us, as we have uh, expected this to be the case for a very long time now. Hell, it's not even an open secret, it is simply just a stated fact these days. We even have, for example, the team behind the disastrous She-Hulk explaining to us verbatim, black and white, that the entire purpose of the show was to deliver a fuck you to the toxic Marvel trolls. <laughs> There's not exactly a whole lot of subtlety in play anymore, now is there? But, to be fair to Nate Moore here, he does go on to say something that I find rather interesting. Namely, that he is a old-time comic fan, always has been and always will be, and still has boxes of comics in his garage. I don't know the man, so I'm simply going to take his word for it, and from the perspective of somebody who has already read every comic book ever, I can see the appeal of something completely different, to reinvent the wheel and flip everything upside down. I get it. The problem is, you're not making Marvel movies for yourself. This is, well, literally, the jaded ex-fan point of view, rather than the point of view of the people who want to go to the cinema to watch the heroes that they love do the things that they have always loved seeing them doing. We must also, of course, mention that seeing something on the big screen is a completely different experience from reading it. Merely by being a movie, a lot of value can, theoretically, be added to a product. There is a reason why Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings is considered as a massive all-time classic and the race of power <laughs> is not. Because one followed the original intent and the will of the writer and the source material and the other, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, I don't think there is a word harsh or strong enough in the English language to fully illustrate what the Rings of Power did to the spirit of Tolkien. We can also translate this into the Marvel Universe, obviously, as well. Everyone loved the first Iron Man movie because it had a lot of Iron Man in it. And in number two and number three, there was less and less Iron Man, and people liked the movies less and less for that very simple, obvious reason. Oh, don't get me wrong, there is absolutely a demand for a darker take on a hero occasionally. In fact, that demand was about 10 years ago, when we'd gotten too much of the goody two-shoes style of character. Then people actually wanted a bit of a flipperoo, but today that is no longer the case. If anything, people are desperate for their heroes to just goddamn be heroes again. Because that's not what we're getting. The podcast goes on to mention Thor Ragnarok, for example, and how it is totally different from any other Thor comic book. And yeah, I can imagine, considering Thor Ragnarok has Thor being a side character, comic relief, in his own bloody movie. He is knocked out by electricity. <laughs> Again and again and again, he has his ass handed to him by every single solitary character. And the end of the movie is Thor losing, having his home destroyed, and eventually being turned into a fat, beer-bellied reject who is handed over the throne 
to <laughs> a black Valkyrie chick who is now king of Asgard. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see why there is no Thor comic book run that is quite like this. <laughs> I can absolutely see why. I... And again, that's the problem. We don't actually have superhero movies anymore. Oh, we occasionally have ritualistic humiliation of our superhero movies, sure. We occasionally have superhero movies that have them somewhere in the background, absolutely. But we don't have superhero movies anymore. And we don't precisely because the people who are hired to make these movies have completely different agendas, which he also goes on to explain in detail. Here, listen to this. And, and Ryan, again, is interested in, in exploring themes of colonization as he was in the first film, and started to look at nations that experienced that, and found some Mayan uh, pottery and, and with glyphs on it where the people were blue. And he was like, oh, that's sort of interesting. And then started to do some research into the, the history of the Mayan people in the past and today. And was and felt like, oh, here's here's an anchor point that could be really interesting. So the filmmaker wanted to make a movie about colonization, but he could only get paid for making a Marvel movie. And so he went as far out of his way as humanly possible to find a piece of busted pottery with blue people on it. And thus, the Atlanteans were Mayans. <laughs> There are stretches. And then there is whatever the hell this is. I mean, the man could give himself a hand job from the other side of the planet with this amount of reach. But hilarity aside, it once again lays bare the actual ambitions here. This is not a guy that's making a Marvel movie, it's a guy who's making a movie about colonialism. Like Wakanda was a movie about, well, racial superiority in the ethnostate. <laughs> Unironically. And it sounds like this one will be, um, well, at the very least on the same track. It's weird how anti colonialism always seems to turn into ethnostatiness, but, um, details, details. The point is, you've got a person who wants to tell a completely different story and has no actual interest in the story he has been hired to tell. And he's been given carte blanche to tell this completely different story by the person who should have been ensuring that he made the story he was being paid to make. It is a truly ridiculous situation, and yet it is everywhere. Andor is the exact same thing. I'm looking forward to doing a longer style video on that, because Andor is the perfect example of taking an entire universe, dropping it by the wayside, stepping on it, pissing on it, setting it on fire, and then doing something completely different, only to wander back and go, why are all of the Star Wars fans unhappy? <laughs> Who knows? But it all spirals back once again. You can't make a good superhero movie if you set out to make something that isn't a superhero movie. Duh. You can't make good Star Wars if you set out to not make a goddamn Star Wars show. This it should be pretty damn obvious, and yet, it apparently isn't. Though, on that note, there are some promising indications that maybe this too is turning. I recently watched Black Adam, for example, and the movie itself was... Eh, it was too long, way too goddamn long, as it actually leaned quite a lot into the idea of Black Adam as a villain, not a anti-hero, not a good guy with problems, no, an actual goddamn villain, which was nice to see, frankly. Although he does end up saving the kids and such stupid things, but it leans quite heavily into the cool aspect of it all, to the point where I wish it had done that and then stopped rather than go on for two odd hours. But there is a scene at the end where we get a brief cameo from Henry Cavill's Superman, and what I noticed was his suit. It's got colors again. Compare this to his suit in Man of Steel. The difference is actually striking. Bearing in mind too, 
in the Black Adam movie, he's in a dark room. He's, he's there in the middle of the night, and yet his suit has more color than his suit in the middle of the bloody desert under the scorching sun in Man of Steel. Now, in part, this might be because Henry Cavill has been pushing for Superman to become a goddamn hero again, and God bless the man for that. I have officially declared him my spirit animal because he seems to actually get it, and there are frighteningly few people in the entertainment industry that do. Who knows? Maybe the DCUE can finally actually do something right. <laughs> That's, that would be a little bit of a miracle, but, uh, you know, with Marvel floundering, maybe, just maybe, this isn't the death of the superhero movie, but actually the start of the actual superhero movies, made by people who want to make superhero movies and acted in by people who want to be superheroes. A man can hope. Naive though it might be. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.